So, good afternoon. My name's Paul Mason and I'm a sports and exercise medicine physician from here in Sydney. And I'm going to do a presentation this afternoon targeted at the female audience. Now, it's a bit of a joke in the low-carb world, isn't it? My female patients tell me they go on a low-carb diet and their husband loses 20 kilograms. <laughs> Them, not so much. And we know that females tend to lose less weight on ketogenic diets, and we usually just put it down to hormones. But it's not always just hormones. There's other factors as well, and some of those factors we can actually do something about. And one of those factors is iron deficiency. Now, as with all my lectures, nothing contained here within should be considered personal medical advice. If you want personal medical advice, please consult your own physician. So, I saw a patient recently. She was a 37-year-old mother of two young children, two boys, three and five years old. And she came along to one of our conferences here last year, and she was motivated. She went keto straight up. She bought the books. I think Peter was still selling books here last year. Joined all the internet forums, and she even got herself a ketone monitor. And she was in ketosis. Her ketone readings were excellent. The trouble is, she wasn't losing any weight. Her high ketone level proved that her body was able to burn fat, but the weight wasn't budging. She felt sluggish. What happened to that promised energy boost? She'd been on all the forums asking for advice. She didn't know what else to do. Before she saw me, she was about to give up. So I took a history and came across some interesting observations. She admitted to craving for ice. Her husband was complaining that she was kicking him all night. And both of these symptoms are consistent with iron deficiency. Craving ice is called pagophagia. And kicking at night is seen in a condition called restless leg syndrome. So we did a blood test. So first of all, you can see there's two columns, an older test on the left and a newer test on the right. And on the far right hand side, you can see the population reference range with the upper and lower values marking out the expected range for 95% of the population. And all of her results are within the reference range. But when we take a closer look, you can see her haemoglobin, the oxygen carrying protein found in red blood cells has fallen. And also her MCV, which stands for mean cell volume, the average size of her red blood cells, has also reduced. And these two findings can occur with iron deficiency. So we did an iron test, and sure enough, the best test for iron deficiency, ferritin, was low. The normal range is between 15 and 200, and in actual fact, it probably should be higher than 15, but she came in at 11 it was pretty clear that she didn't have any iron reserves in her body. Now, this is ferritin. It's a protein that the body uses to store iron. And we know that because her iron, her ferritin was low, she was definitely losing weight. And it may have been because of this deficiency. That is, the low iron level could have been the reason she wasn't losing weight. And the reason for this is that many proteins and enzymes in the body need iron to function. And one of these is called cytochrome. And cytochrome is essential for something we call oxidative phosphorylation. Basically, that's the major energy producing pathway in the body. And if we disturb this pathway, then we'll have trouble metabolizing fuel for energy. And impaired energy expenditure leads to difficulty in losing weight. One major point that's often overlooked when it comes to ketogenic diets is the first law of thermodynamics. That is, to lose weight, we still need to burn more energy than we take in. And just because we've trained the body to burn fat, as my patient had proven with her ketone level, doesn't mean necessarily that it will burn fat. To do that, we have to create a calorie deficit. And the problem is, in an iron deficient state, the balance of energy expenditure to intake is upset. It means that we burn less energy. It makes it harder to lose weight, even after accounting for the appetite suppressing effects of the ketogenic diet. And the evidence supports this. I'm a sports doctor. 
And we see a lot of athletes with iron deficiency. And in studies with athletes who have normal levels of red blood cells, normal hemoglobin, but low iron levels, iron supplementation has been shown to improve exercise performance. Something we call VO2 max, which is a measure of the body's ability to use oxygen, significantly increases in these athletes when we give them iron. And what about anemic females? Well, in this study, who was looking at anemic females with low iron, we got a similar response. And in this study, treating iron deficiency led to weight loss, also led to reduced waist circumference, and it even improved a number of parameters in the blood. It lowered the triglyceride level and increased the HDL level. So let's just say that again. Treating iron deficiency in this population led to weight loss without any dietary change without any change in exercise habits. So why is iron deficiency such a problem for females? Well, first of all, they're much less likely to eat red meat. In fact, males eat 50% more red meat than females. And red meat is the best source of iron. And one of the reasons red meat is so good is that it contains something called heme iron. In fact, about 45% of the iron contained in red meat is of the heme variety. Then if we have a look at eggs and dairy, they also have a small amount of iron, but that's in the non-heme form, and that's not as well absorbed. Even if we give vitamin C concurrently with these foods, it still doesn't allow the non-heme iron to be as well absorbed as the heme iron. And then we get to plant foods. They also have the non-heme iron, which isn't as well absorbed. But in addition, they also have active inhibitors of iron absorption. For example, you have tannins, which is a type of polyphenol, and they're found in tea and chocolate and berries and nuts and seeds and a bunch of other things. And tannins strongly inhibit the absorption of iron. Another example is something we call oxalate. And this explains why cooked spinach is an okay source of iron, but raw spinach is not. That's because in raw spinach, the oxalates block the absorption of iron. So red meat really is the best source for iron. And the reason red meat contains so much iron is because of this protein called myoglobin. Myoglobin contains iron and is how we transport oxygen within our muscles. And a lot of people think that the colour from red meat comes from blood. It doesn't. It actually comes from this protein myoglobin. And if we look at different types of meat, we see that as the myoglobin content increases, the meat gets darker. See chicken breast? Very little myoglobin. It's not going to have very much heme iron at all. Beef, that's a different story. So the darker the meat, the more the iron. And that's why avoiding red meat can be a problem with regards to iron status. Another reason that some people avoid red meat is concern about the production of carcinogenic compounds with cooking, especially on high heat. This includes polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and heterocyclic amines. And it's true, cooking red meat at high temperature does lead to production of these compounds. The thing is, so does cooking white meat. There's no difference. So if you're worried about red meat, you should also be worried about white meat. That includes poultry, fish, pork. And if you're really worried about these compounds, then the obvious thing to do would be to cook your meat at lower heat in a moist fashion. Let's now turn our attention to another issue particular to females and that's menstrual blood loss. By some estimates, up to one third of females might be at risk of iron deficiency due to heavy periods because there's iron contained within blood. And this is a study of 476 females from Gothenburg showing the average menstrual blood loss per cycle. And you can see that most females lose about 30 or 40 mils, but a not insignificant proportion of them can lose far more. And loss of more than about 60 mils per cycle is strongly associated with iron deficiency anemia. You can see it's not that uncommon at all. Another cause of excess iron loss is pregnancy and childbirth. Now remember my patient, she had two young children, three and five years old. The placenta and the fetus require a lot of iron. The mother's red blood volume increases in pregnancy, that requires more iron. And further, there's blood loss associated with labour. So it's estimated that each pregnancy and birth results in the loss of about 1,000 milligrams of iron. And this compares for the 
average adult female, she's only got about 3,500 milligrams in her whole body. So that's a big chunk. And iron deficiency, especially if you have multiple pregnancies in a short period of time, or if you had borderline iron status prior to your pregnancy, is very, very common. And my patient, she had two young children, and she also had a history of heavy periods. So what did we do? Well, two things. I prescribed her a medication to help her with her periods, and she received an iron infusion. And just eight weeks later, so you can see the difference between 11 and 167, we had a significant increase in her ferritin. Not only that, she had stopped craving ice, she'd stopped kicking her husband. <laughs> and she was also ecstatic to tell me at this review appointment that the scales had finally started to move. Now, I'd like to discuss oral iron supplementation just for a moment. So if someone is unable to consume red meat for whatever reason, supplementation can be necessary. And traditionally, we give oral iron supplementation in a daily fashion. But there's a recent study that have shown that giving it on alternate days actually leads to an increase in the absorption with less side effects. So if you do take an oral iron supplement, it's quite reasonable to take it three days a week. Now, before we look at our next patient, I want to explore the relationship between iron and bacteria. Most bacteria that cause human disease require iron to live and to multiply. And we see that people with increased amounts of iron in their blood, people with <coughs> conditions like hemochromatosis, are much more susceptible to bacterial infections. So we have an elegant mechanism in our body to keep this bacteria away from the iron. And this mechanism centres around a molecule called hepcidin. And hepcidin levels increase when you have a bacterial infection. And the effect of high hepcidin is to lock iron away in the ferritin molecule as well as other things, so it can't be used. It keeps it out of reach of the bacteria, slowing their growth. That's a good thing. So what happens is we can't use the iron from the ferritin, so our ferritin levels increase. Essentially, we end up with starvation in the land of plenty. There's lots of iron, but it can't be used. In one sense, this is good because it limits microbial access to iron and it reduces the severity of an infection. And this is important in our defence against bacterial infections. But here's the problem. The process can also occur with non-infectious causes of inflammation. Things like diabetes and obesity. Fat cells are actually inherently inflammatory. And some infections can be prolonged, such as parasitic infections in the gut. And then it's not only the bacteria that suffer the consequences of iron deficiency, but we do too. Our mitochondria, the little power plants that burn energy, they don't function properly. We have trouble expending energy, and this can impact on weight loss. So when I saw a 25-year-old lady with a history of bloating and stomach pain who was on a ketogenic diet and not losing weight, I was suspicious. So we did some blood tests, but we saw that her ferritin was high. So not iron deficiency, right? But remember, ferritin increases with inflammation. It's what we call an acute phase reactant. And I suspected that that was the case in this situation. So I did another blood test for inflammation called C-reactive protein, and that was high. That confirmed inflammation. So then the next problem was working out where the inflammation was coming from. What was the cause of it? And the biggest clue came when we looked at her white blood cells. And one type of white blood cell called an eosinophil was elevated. And this can be seen with parasitic infections. So I got her to donate a faecal sample. And we performed a DNA test called polymerase chain reaction on the faecal sample, looking for evidence of 10 different types of gut-related pathogens. And this is what we found. There was DNA evidence of two different parasites. Now, the significance of these two in particular is sometimes uncertain. But given that she had a history of stomach pain, that her inflammation, the CRP, was up, and she had elevated eosinophils, we were pretty confident that they were causing problems. So we decided to treat her with antibiotics. And a couple of months later, on her review, all of her tests were now within the standard reference ranges. 
Her ferritin had come back down to normal, her CRP was normal, and her eosinophils, this white blood cell marker of parasitic infection, was also now normal. She was delighted to tell me that all of the bloating and nausea and discomfort which she had come to accept of normal had vanished. And not only that, the scale had finally started to move. So we considered that a win. And the problem was functional iron sequestration, it was being locked away by inflammation. It was very similar to iron deficiency, except it wasn't. So please, if you're struggling on a ketogenic diet, don't just give up. There could be a number of reasons why the weight's not coming off. And for females, iron deficiency is one of the most common ones. And if you have chronic inflammation, sometimes we just need to treat this chronic inflammation first, and then the weight loss will follow. Thank you.